International News Now. All right, so for today's session, we're going to cover the following issues. First, we're going to provide an overview of recent developments in this crisis. We're going to provide a summary of the major moves taken by both sides in the crisis. And as a lot happened, and just so you know, it is 2.40 on Thursday, February 17th. We're just setting down that benchmark because we expect things to change. So and they have- I found Monday there's an invasion and you're, you're watching this. You're like, how did they miss that? Yeah. It's because it's Thursday yes. right now. Yes, very um, good. And lots of things have changed in the last few hours and we expect that to be the case um, moving it's forward. It's a fluid situation. Yeah. So we're gonna briefly discuss how the US and its allies gave the world dire warnings of an imminent Russian invasion that American intelligence reported could have begun this week. The U.S. and other countries told their citizens to leave Ukraine as soon as possible, including the United States, even moved its embassy out of the capital in Kyiv. Yet, Russia did not invade, not yet at least. In fact, early this week, Russia announced that it was partially withdrawing some of its forces and returning them to their bases. The Russian military even released a video, propaganda, <laughs> showing tanks being loaded on trains and transported away. But the United States and the West say that there is no evidence that Russia is truly withdrawing forces and de-escalating the conflict. Now there's a clash of competing information coming from Western governments and NATO and Russia. So we're going to talk about some of these discrepancies. The other big new development was a major speech given by President Biden on the Ukraine crisis. We're going to break down that speech. Um, after that, we're going to take a step back and discuss what this crisis says about U.S. grand strategy under the Biden administration, we we'll discuss how president's actions and rhetoric reflect his distinct grand strategy and an emerging Biden doctrine. And then we'll conclude by examining the Ukraine crisis through what Rob mentioned is a concept called the bargaining model of war. We'll explain how theories and IR view the origins of war as a bargaining failure between two adversaries who cannot find an acceptable bargain to resolve a conflict rather than paying the high costs of going to war. And in this case, the fundamental issue in dispute is the long-term political status of Ukraine. Will it be independent? Will it be independent and join NATO? Or will it re-enter the Russian sphere of influence and have its independence compromised? Yeah, and it could be compromised in you know, a lot of different ways. I mean, if there's a full invasion, it's going to cease being you know, an and it kind of, it's yeah. independent state. It'll become part of Russia, just like Crimea used to be part of Ukraine, and now, because of a military action by Russia, is part of Russia, and a contested part, but one that's not going to change anytime soon unless another military action is taken. So, so this is where we're at now. We want to start today with a discussion of recent developments surrounding the crisis over this past week, and, and it has been kind of a whirlwind, to be honest. Over the past week, we went from dire warnings of imminent invasion to Russia announcing a partial withdrawal, to the US and NATO saying that Russia isn't really withdrawing at all, and Russia saying that the West is engaged in war hysteria, uh, trying to trump up, uh, and this, this is a claim here, and, and in fact, I think it's in one of the clips here, uh, that Russia is accusing the West of sort of publicizing falsely that Russia is about to invade to punish Russia with sanctions. So, so it's all a bit confusing. So we're going to start in this um, overview with a news clip that uh, is from yesterday, Wednesday, and uh, it sort of discusses the most recent developments. So it's, uh, it's about... Um, the, the announced withdrawal, but also the questions are surrounding those. So let's run that clip now. The U.S. says Russia's claims that it is de-escalating tensions on the Ukraine border are, quote, false. A senior administration official says tonight that Russia has added 7,000 troops to the nearly 150,000 troops already near the border. The news comes as defiant Ukrainians staged a show of national unity today. Nick Schifrin begins our coverage. On a day the U.S. government feared would bring a new war, Ukraine celebrated a new holiday. 
On Unity Day, Ukrainians held a 600-foot-long flag and rallied around the national anthem titled Ukraine is not yet perished. It signifies the unity of the whole country under our flag, under our anthem. It is no to war, yes to peace. But Ukraine is also readying for war. Its Air Force released video today of Russian-made jets training near the northern border with Belarus to practice targeting columns of tanks. And Ukrainian tanks train nearby. President Volodymyr Zelensky watched with his commanders before inspecting American anti-tank weapons and addressing his troops. Thank you for your skills, for protecting our country. When I look at you, I'm confident in both today and tomorrow. The U.S. officials remain worried that tomorrow or any day could bring Russian invasion. Just across the Belarus border, Russia continued its own exercises. U.S. officials worry these troops could be used to invade western Ukraine. But Russia says it has no intention to invade and release video overnight of tanks. And trucks today, it said, pulled back from forward positions in Crimea and returned garrison. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said the West fabricated a Russian threat to punish Moscow. They are trying to bring all weight to bear on us, having invented a Russian threat and using this pretense to impose more sanctions. The U.S. officials accuse Russia of inventing a withdrawal that's not actually happening. The Ministry of Defense said yesterday these troops were returning to their bases, but independent researchers say their bases are actually right on the Ukraine border. A U.S. official called the videos staged for deception. Secretary of State Antony uh, Blinken. Unfortunately, there's a difference between Russia says and, and what it does. Uh, and what we're seeing is no uh, meaningful pullback. On the contrary, we continue to see forces, especially forces that would be in the vanguard of any uh, renewed aggression against Ukraine, continuing uh, to, uh, to be at the border, uh, to mass at the border. That was echoed at a NATO defense minister's meeting in Brussels by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. What we see on the ground is no uh, withdrawal of troops and forces, uh, equipment. But actually what we see is that uh, Russian troops are moving into position and we saw uh, the uh, cyber attack. That cyber attack yesterday took down the websites of Ukraine's two largest banks and the foreign and defense ministries. Today, Ukrainian officials told reporters the source was unclear, but likely a, quote, foreign intelligence service. And with no evidence of de-escalation, the Russian-created threat on Ukraine's border remains a crisis. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schiffer. Okay, so let me just lay out a bit of a timeline on how events unfolded at the end of last week and into this week, right? And so, so the week uh, started with dire warnings of an imminent invasion with Western intelligence even noting a potential start date of this uh, invasion for, of Wednesday, February 16th. And I remember I was texting Pat McDonald here and saying, I think it's, this is it. I think it's, they're gonna go and, and he, said something IR-like, and he's like, I updated my calculations on this. <laughs> and I'm like, I think you're right. I said, yeah, of course I'm right. <laughs> but that, but, you're wrong. <laughs> but I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but the invasion didn't happen. So, so imminent invasion. And the thing that made me think that, inv that they had some real um, intelligence that suggested that it was gonna happen soon wasn't the date, but the move of the embassy from Kiev to, Lv to Lv Lviv. I kept saying Lvov when I was in Ukraine and they kept, no, Lviv. To Lviv in Western Ukraine. And uh, Zelensky uh, criticized that move, saying that um, there is no Western Ukraine, it's all Ukraine. He didn't like the symbolism of that. But um, that tipped me to thinking that there was gonna be an invasion because of the the dramatic decision to move your embassy out, thinking that you don't want it overrun by Russian troops. So, so that was early in the week, but then the invasion didn't happen. And instead there was some positive news on the diplomatic front. Russia announced to much sort of media fanfare, especially in Russia, that it was partially withdrawing some of its forces. And there was uh, some, <clears throat> Some news conferences and other um, um, media reports that President Putin has said he wanted to continue di dialogue, even though the West did not meet his demands yet. And so, so there was this 
and they made a lot of this. There was this kind of staged conversation on um, Russian national television between Putin and his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, and it was pretty dramatic. It showed Putin and asking Lavrov if, if there was any hope for Russia and the West to come to some agreement and avoid war, and then he sort of dramatically pauses and says, well, there's, there's always some hope. And then he, and then he said, um, and he suggested that Putin uh, continue diplomacy. And he says, yeah, you're probably right. And then they, and then, and it's like, you're going to do whatever the, I'm going to say, heck, you want. And, you know, you're not going to listen to Lavrov anyway. But it was this kind of dramatic staged thing. And, and it's important to note how in this crisis, more than I've seen even in the 2014 um, crisis over Crimea, the, the information conflict is a really big part of what both sides, Russia and the United States, are, are trying to, to control here. And, and we'll talk a bit more about this when we talk about uh, Biden's speech and the use of intelligence by the United States um, to quickly, that's quickly disseminated right away to sort of uh, showcase what the United States expects Russia's moves um, really are. And so, so there was, so first predictions of imminent um, invasion, then a step away from what looked like an impending invasion, an announcement of a partial withdrawal, ho raising hopes that there might be some diplomatic solution. But of course, this potential de-escalation was also not stable or too good to be true, right? And so the United States, followed by uh, NATO allies and, and other um, observers of the troop movements by Russia, they questioned whether Russia was actually withdrawing its troops or was instead engaging in another campaign of misinformation by publicly stating it was stepping back from an invasion but not actually removing any significant number of troops. And, and so, in fact, as the clip showed, the West claims that Russia was actually moving more troops into position to threaten Ukraine and that an, an, an invasion was actually still on the table and quite uh, imminent. And in fact, the latest intelligence I saw this morning was that they're, they're seeing um, shipments of, of blood uh, to the front to um, within the expectation of casualties and, and other, other signs that, that, yes, an invasion seems to still be very much in play. And so this is where we stand, right? Uh, it's a very fluid situation. Russia is still insisting that it is still in a partial withdrawal and it takes some time. And the United States is still taking the position that Russia is falsely claiming that it's withdrawing troops when it's not, right? And so there's this kind of war of, of information. Uh, both sides are accusing the other of making false statements and accusations about their intentions when it comes to Ukraine. And so that's, in the, that's the context where President Biden gave this very important speech. And so we're going to move on to that now. All right, so let's take a closer look at Biden's speech on Ukraine from this week. We're going to start by watching a clip from ABC News on the speech. So let's go ahead and run that clip now. Tonight, in plain, stark terms, President Biden warned that a Russian invasion of Ukraine is still a very real and very dire possibility. And this striking moment, the U.S. president speaking directly to the Russian people. To the citizens of Russia, you are not our enemy. And I do not believe you want a bloody, destructive war against Ukraine. Biden spoke a few hours after the Kremlin claimed some Russian troops are leaving their forward positions and returning to their bases after completing their military exercises. The Russian Defense Ministry releasing this video of tanks they say are being transported away from areas near Ukraine. We have not yet verified the Russian military units are returning to their home bases. ABC News has learned tonight that the U.S. government sees no evidence of a Russian withdrawal. In fact, the U.S. continues to see some Russian troops actually moving into forward firing positions. Those U.S. sources also believe that Vladimir Putin has told his military to be ready for action by tomorrow, but that it's still unclear if he has made a decision to invade Ukraine. 
And while Ukraine is not a NATO member, Biden with a clear message to Putin about any broader ambitions he might have. And make no mistake, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory with the full force of American power. In Moscow, after meeting with Germany's leader today, Putin said he had decided to, quote, partially pull back troops, but he was cryptic about what lies ahead. Papalan. How will Russia act next? According to plan, Putin declared, adding he did not consider the crisis over and that his security demands to bar Ukraine permanently from joining NATO and to roll back the alliance to 1997 positions had not been met by the West. But Putin did say again he was ready to continue on the negotiating track. So President Biden repeated several key points that he said throughout the crisis. It's important to note, though, that repeating a clear position and policy is vitally important during the crisis. Biden wants Russia, Ukraine, NATO, and the U.S. public and the rest of the world to know where the U.S. stands on Russia's aggression towards Ukraine and what it plans to do if Russia invades Ukraine. This is a key part of Biden's attempt to convince Russia that it would pay a very high price, too high of a price, if it sends troops across the border into Ukraine. He's trying to be very clear about this. So there's no doubt within his various audiences on what the U.S. policy is and why the U.S. is following this policy. So what did Biden say in the speech? First, Biden questioned Russia's announcement that it was partially withdrawing troops from the border. This may seem counterintuitive. Russia's more conciliatory tone seems like something the U.S. and NATO should welcome and reciprocate. However, it seems that two things might be at work here. First, it remains unclear what Putin's intentions are. This announcement of a partial withdrawal could be a strategy to weaken the uni unified front that the U.S. and NATO has managed to maintain against Russian moves at the border. The Biden administration wants to maintain its readiness for a sudden move against Ukraine or some partial attack that does not involve a full invasion. In fact, despite the announced partial withdrawal, several actions by Russia suggest that an invasion is still likely. For example, the Russian parliament passed a resolution to officially recognize the independence of two regions of eastern Ukraine. Parliament motion calls for President Putin to formally recognize the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, both of which declared independence from Ukraine in 2014. No other country government currently recognizes these republics as sovereign states. This could provide a pretext for Russian military intervention, where the Russian government says it's doing, is doing an invasion to protect Russian speakers from these regions from harm. So related to this, Russia has filed a report with the United Nations alleging that Ukraine's military has committed crimes against Russian speakers in these eastern provinces of Ukraine. Putin has publicly called the conflict in eastern Ukraine a, quote, genocide. And the United States has viewed these steps as disinformation and laying a pretext and legitimation for a Russian invasion of Ukraine. A second, demanding actions and concrete evidence of a de-escalation rather than just words keeps the pressure on Putin and Russia. So Biden's approach makes other options like a cyber attack on Ukraine, which did happen, or a partial invasion of just eastern Ukraine, where Russia backs separatists are already fighting, makes them less viable options. So Biden had also reiterated his retaliatory threats of high costs if Russia invades. He's been talking about harsh economic sanctions that could cripple the Russian economy and export controls on technology, U.S. export controls on technology that could hit Russian industry hard throughout the crisis. He also emphasized that while the United States and NATO were not going to directly use military forces to protect Ukraine, the West would provide weapons to help Ukrainians defend themselves. Now, none of these threats are new, but they serve as a reminder of the high cost that Russia would pay if it invaded Ukraine. The Biden administration and NATO, they're trying to convince Russia that it's simply not worth it and Russia should instead enter into negotiations about issues that the U.S. is willing to discuss on arms control and the transparency of military exercises. Biden is trying to push Russia to take a diplomatic off-ramp that avoids war through negotiations that would provide Putin and Russia with an increased sense of security
but also retain Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now, Biden also recommitted the United States to military intervention to protect NATO allies. This also is not new, but it's an important signal to both Russia and NATO members on NATO's eastern flank. The Biden administration has been very clear that the U.S. will not use military force to protect Ukraine against attack because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. But the NATO treaty commits all NATO members to view an attack on one member as an attack on all members. So Biden is drawing a very clear line that the U.S. would use its military to defend Romania, Poland, and the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania if Putin threatens them. And so this would be a real fighting war with Russia to nuclear armed states fighting over if, if, if Putin would do the very same thing that he's doing to Ukraine. And it's important here to note how some of these countries, especially the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, are historically in the very same place as Ukraine. They used to be part of the Soviet Union. The only difference is those three states are in NATO and Ukraine is not, which just sharpens the sort of high stakes of the status of Ukraine here. It changes that status. If they're in NATO, lots of things change. If they're out, then you have this. So. so there is this fear that an invasion of Ukraine could spread to a wider European war that would involve these NATO members. Moreover, if Russia would successfully invade Ukraine, there's a chance that it could consider following a similar approach to other states that used to be within Russia's sphere of influence during the Cold War. So finally, Biden also took another important step in the speech that we want to emphasize. For the first time, he told the American public that it will likely face some economic hardships if Russia invades Ukraine and the U.S. impose the sanctions that it has threatened. This is significant. We can see the stock market is reacting to this today and this week. Um, energy markets, oil, natural gas markets are responding to these threats. So we have a very short clip on this part of the speech from ABC News. So let's run, run that clip now. Cecilia, the president also made it very clear today that if Russia attacks Ukraine, the swift U.S. response will very likely affect the economy here at home, saying Americans uh, should be prepared. Yeah, David, he, exactly. He's trying to convey to Americans why they should feel invested in this outcome. In no uncertain terms, he said today, if Russia does this invasion, Americans will feel this at home and it will not be painless. He said, now, I just asked the White House, what is the worst case scenario that Americans should expect if this happens? The press secretary telling me energy prices could rise. Americans will feel that, feel that at the pump. David, we have already seen gas prices rise in recent weeks because of these tensions. But the president said today, defending democracy and Liberty is never without cost, David. So first, in warning the American public that a Russian invasion and American sanctions that would follow may hurt American consumers, Biden's trying to mobilize American support from his confrontational approach towards Russia on this issue. Remember last week's lecture in our analysis of American public opinion on this crisis. There's not a large partisan split on this issue. More Democrats and Republicans saw Russia's actions as a minor rather than a major threat. So this is President Biden trying to use the bully pulpit of the presidency to shape public opinion, prepare the American public and get U.S. citizens to back strong measures in retaliation against a Russian invasion of Ukraine, even if it significantly in increases inflation in the United States. We should talk a little bit, I think, about why. Why he's asking the United States public to say, look, you know, if oil prices and gas prices and, and everything that's related to that, because, you know, that will trickle through the whole economy, if that really starts to, to hurt U.S. consumers, why should they tolerate that um, to help a country so far away against Re Russian invasion? And, and, and it's, it's built around this idea of... Um, protecting democracy, protecting against aggression, and, and, and sort of keeping the international system uh, that we currently have in place. And so we're going to talk a bit about that. And, and can I now. just add, yeah, and yeah. this is also about protecting NATO. 
right. um, in a sense, right, because the, you know, the underlying long-term problem here is if Putin takes Ukraine, is he going to try and take the Baltics? And the U.S. does not, it's trying to stand firm on Ukraine here right. without threatening to go to war so it doesn't face the same thing with respect to NATO members three years from now, four years from now, or six months from now. Right, and, and this is a huge thing. I mean, he, Biden said just that, if you don't stand and protect democracies now and you don't stand against aggression now, you're gonna pay a higher price later. And that's what he's trying to convey is that, that as much as you might not think this, this affects your daily life um, right now, and, and whereas gas prices will, He's trying to convey this bigger picture that this is important, not just on principle, but in strategy and, and, and international stability, that, that you're going to pay a higher price if you don't. And, and let's just keep this in context. NATO, the preservation of NATO and working yes. within that alliance has been a core national security interest of the United States since 1949. Yeah. It is, more importantly... Yes, this is the plan, the alliance, this is the plan for confronting the new reality of great power politics going into the next 40 or 50 years. The U.S. needs right. Europe as it turns and pivots to China. Right. So it cannot allow, and what President Biden is worried about, and Republicans in Congress, because there's, right. there's, there's a bipartisan there's consensus this, yeah. here, you cannot allow NATO to get chipped away now when the United States could really use it 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. And so this is one of the reasons why Biden is standing so firmly here. And so this is a nice segue into our next sort of topic here. And, and we're going to take a... So, so you've got this crisis. We don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of different sort of strategic positions taken by both sides trying to avoid this war, but also trying to signal that um, in order to avoid the war, signal how the great cost of, of going to war, right? So they're trying to detour deter Russia from, from starting. And so we're going to take a step back and, and show how the Ukraine crisis and the Biden administration's reaction to it, um, especially his, his protection, if you will, as, as uh, Professor McDonald just said, of NATO and, and, the, and the integrity and stability of NATO, is a part of his broader grand strategy. And, and we're going to start with a clip that um, from the PBS NewsHour that um, shows some expert, uh, foreign policy expert reaction to Biden's speech. And so let's go ahead and run that clip now. The message President Biden delivered today, how should the American people read that? I, I think it's a very important message uh, to send uh, at this point in time. Look, we're at a pivotal time here. Uh, and a dangerous time uh, with regards to the United States, with regards to the Ukraine, with regards to our allies and Russia. Uh, and what happens here will tell us a lot about the future. Uh, and so it, it was important for President Biden to send a very tough, clear, concise, and honest message uh, to Russia that the United States and our allies remain strong, remain unified, uh, and if they decide to invade, that they will pay a heavy price. That's a very important message for Putin to hear at this point in time. And, and Secretary Panetta, is, this, is it your sense that the president was doubling down on what he has said before? Is he uh, underlining it? I mean, how do you read what, what came from the president today that's different from what he has said before? Well, I think it's obvious that in dealing with Putin, you have to deal with him from strength. Uh, for, for too long, Putin has read weakness on the part of the United States, and as a result of it, took advantage of that in Georgia and the Crimea, in Syria, and against the United States in a cyber war. Uh, what's happening today is that the United States and our allies are drawing a line that makes very clear to Russia that if they decide to invade, they will pay a very heavy price. That's a very important line to set uh, with Putin. And I think because of that, uh, I think we have, in, in many ways, disrupted his strategy. He likes to operate in the dark, and now he has to operate in the open. 
uh, and that makes it much more difficult for him to have his way. All right, so let me sort of outline a few key elements of Biden's grand strategy that are sort of showcased by this Ukraine crisis. And this clip sort of um, emphasizes uh, these things too. And, and, and there's three of them, really. There's first, multilateralism. The Biden administration and, and per, uh, Joe Biden, when he entered office and when he campaigned for the presidency before that, really made the NATO coalition and the sort of alliance system of democracies, a centerpiece of his foreign policy. Multilateralism was going to be a priority, and, and he viewed it as a sort of a corrective to uh, the undermining and weakening of that NATO alliance during the Trump administration, where there was a lot more internal conflict over uh, disagreements about burden sharing and, and issues like that. And so what Biden wanted to do is he said, we have to have a foreign policy that is supported by a strong and unified NATO. And, and this Ukraine crisis shows two things. One, that um, he's trying to, to conduct foreign policy through NATO with this unified um, position where he's working very closely with France, Germany, other NATO allies, through the NATO institutions, and is pitching the confrontation with Russia as a uh, protection, a, a broader issue of protection of European stability and the um, security infrastructure that's centered around uh, NATO. And so multilateralism is part of this sort of Biden doctrine, if you will. The second is these principles that he says is the centerpiece of why the United States is confronting Russia and trying to keep it from invading Ukraine, that you just can't have a stable international system and a stable Europe and a peaceful Europe if you allow larger countries to invade smaller countries, if you allow the undermining of a rules-based international order in which sovereignty isn't um, protected and uh, respected and that democracies are left unprotected from aggression by autocracies um, for their own purposes. And so this idea of principles and a multilateral approach um, centered on NATO to protect those principles would be the second key thing that is also uh, showcased here. And then the third one is confronting autocratic regimes. Biden really ran on this as one of his major foreign policy goals, that Russia wouldn't get away with, if you will, those sorts of aggressive moves that he got away with, arguably, in the, under the Biden, I mean, the Obama administration, um, where uh, Joe Biden was vice president. He's trying to shift this away and say that no longer will the United States sit and uh, watch uh, Russia take, use its military to invade countries and take territory uh, without any uh, repercussions. And so confronting autocracies by aggressively uniting Western democracies against that um, is a key part of this. And um, this is sort of the Biden doctrine, if you will, in, um, in action. Russia, one day, uh, Putin woke up one day and said, look, I'm, I, I'm tired of Ukraine always wanting to join NATO. We're going to put a stop to it, and I'm going to use my military to do it. Marshals all these forces, and the Biden administration um, really mobilizes NATO to confront that and to make credible threats about punishment to, in order to try to stop that kind of activity. And, and what I, um, we're gonna see another clip about the credibility and the effectiveness of this approach right now. And then we're gonna say a few things about how pivotal, pivotal this particular crisis is for that kind of foreign policy approach, that kind of grand strategy that Biden is trying to um, enact here. And so let's go ahead and run that 
clip now. In terms of drawing a line, we've seen the United States draw lines before that then it was not prepared to back up. Uh, how much does it matter that the West fulfills what it says now will be the consequences if Putin and the Russians uh, move aggressively, further aggressively into Ukraine? It's absolutely essential that uh, when the United States and now with our NATO allies have drawn a line, that they stick to that line uh, and implement what they say they're going to do. Uh, and I don't have any question uh, right now that both the United States and our allies will implement very tough uh, economic sanctions uh, that will have an impact uh, on Russia and its economy. Uh, they've already taken steps to provide uh, defensive weapons to reinforce our NATO position uh, with our forces uh, and to continue to support the Ukraine with training and other assistance uh, at this moment in time. So I think we have shown that we are going to stick to what we're saying, and that's a very important signal to send not just to Russia, very frankly, but to China and to our other adversaries. And, and to Angela Stint, um, is, this, is this a message that Vladimir Putin is likely to be intimidated by? I mean, how much punishment can he, is he prepared to take? I don't think he's going to be intimidated by this. I mean, the Russians, I think, have already factored in the sanctions. They may not realize the full repercussions of them, uh, but they do have over $600 billion in hard currency reserves. They have China who will back them up, even though I think China would prefer that there not be an invasion. I don't think he's intimidated by that. Um, and I do believe, you know, this, what kind of sanctions are imposed if there is a military incursion will depend on what kind of military incursion it is. And if it is more limited just into the area where you already have Russian forces in the Donbass, I do not think you will get the same robust reaction from all of our allies. If it's an all-out assault on Kiev, then I think you would. Okay, so this clip showcases how it is so important that the United States and NATO remain unified and make credible threats that raise the costs of Russian aggression, but then follow through on those threats if Russia still, despite those um, threats and the, and the potentially high cost of invasion, uh, goes ahead with uh, its act of um, compromising Ukrainian sovereignty. And so, so what though that clip kind of showcases is this is a pivotal time for the United States, its sort of standing in the world, and also its foreign policy under the Biden administration to kind of be the leader of a Democrat, uh, an alliance of Democrat democracies that could um, constrain and confront autocracies. Uh, if it works, if the United States, led by the Biden, uh, and if the United States leads NATO to sort of hold together, sanction Russia, and either limit any sort of invasion or prevent it, then the United States will sort of gain, gain a lot of credibility at a pivotal, pivotal time uh, where it faces a lot of these kinds of threats and from China, from North Korea, from Iran, etc. But if not, if instead the United States and NATO can't keep their unified front together right now. Russia does invade Ukraine and somehow sort of survives economic sanctions and, and doesn't seem to be chastened or, or punished enough by those sanctions. Um, the United States will have a very difficult time sort of following this same model when it tries to confront autocracies in China, Iran or North Korea. And that's why when Leon Panetta says, you know, the world's watching, China's watching, this sends signals to all these other countries that might think that China might think, you know, if we intervened against Taiwan and, and used force to bring it back into uh, the political system of mainland China, would the United States really do anything? If the U.S. And NATO can stick together against Russian aggression, the sig signal to China would be, yeah, I might not want to do that. So now we're going to take a step back and analyze the Ukraine crisis.
through a concept that we will be covering in the next couple of weeks called the bargaining model of war. The, the crisis is a good example of how we can use this theoretical model to help us understand the origins of war and the potential for peace here. So first we need to briefly explain what the bargaining model of war is and tries to accomplish. This model creates a theoretical foundation to explain why wars occur and what conditions facilitate the avoidance or the termination of wars. It tries to explain the outbreak of war by looking at the use or threatened use of military force as a form of bargaining, as a way that states try to achieve their goals in a political conflict with another state. For, so for example, Russia doesn't want Ukraine to enter NATO. And it's using the threat of military force to convince Ukraine and NATO not to allow Ukraine to become a part of the military alliance. So the core political conflict here is about the long-term political status of Ukraine. The bargaining model of war has a key assumption, and that assumption is that war imposes costs on all of its participants. War causes casualties, destroys infrastructure, ruins economies, and topples governments. These costs affect all of their participants, and the costs then create a reward for avoiding war and preserving peace. All those casualties, all that destruction, economic and political fallout can all be avoided if states step back from the brink and find a peaceful compromise. So then the fundamental puzzle that emerges from this framework is why can't political organizations like states identify and sustain a, a negotiated settlement that avoids the cost of war and simultaneously benefits all the parties? So in our current discussion of the crisis over Ukraine, we've argued that Russia and the United States, sh neither one of them should want a war over Ukraine. It would harm both sides. It's going to harm Ukraine. The bargaining model of war also asks why these two parties can't strike a deal that would satisfy at least partially both sides and avoid war. So answers to this question about what prevents peaceful compromise then become explanation for why wars occur. There are two prominent sets of bargaining failures and causes for war. We're going to concentrate on just one of them in our discussion of the crisis in Ukraine, and that's the commitment problem. Commitment problems are problems associated with sustaining an agreement over time, maintaining your commitments to preserve any obligations within an agreement over time. We can think about this Ukraine crisis as a commitment problem, and we're going to explain this in more uh, detail momentarily. So before we get to the commitment problem, I want to just describe how the Russian uh, buildup of forces really can be understood from the perspective of a bargaining model. And we've kind of already done this, so we're going to just run through it pretty quickly. The first thing to note is that the uh, that a war in Ukraine would have a huge high cost for all sides. Uh, a Russian invasion would uh, have thousands of casualties for Russian forces, but also for Ukrainian forces and its population. It would produce a re refugee crisis in Europe. It would rupture relations between Russia and the West and severely harm the Russian economy. And it would harm NATO and the United States leadership of NATO and its hegemonic position in the world. All of those costs would come from an, a Russian invasion. Okay, so that's the high cost. That's what both sides and all involved should want to avoid all of those things. And then what's the bargain? Like Professor McDonald said, it's all about the status of Ukraine. Russia wants to keep Ukraine from entering NATO. The West, United States and NATO, want to maintain Ukraine's sovereignty. They don't want necessarily to say to take Ukraine into NATO right now, but they want the freedom for Ukraine to decide its own alliances, and it wants to maintain NATO's open-door policy for new entrants, that, that NATO wouldn't be restrained by Russia and what Russia wants and Russia says, and especially when Russia uses force to pressure them. And so that's the conflict. What's going to be the status of Russia then? there needs to be a successful bargain on the status of Ukraine that would need to bridge that gap between the competing demands from Russia that Ukraine never be allowed to enter NATO and the demands by the West that Ukraine be allowed to ally with whomever it wants and have sovereignty. So that's the bargain. They just got to find that um, middle ground, right, that compromise that, that avoids war. So now that we've set up the idea of the bargaining model of war and how it can help us to understand the conflict here, 
um, surrounding Ukraine and how Russia and the United States are using military force and threats of sanctions to try to get the other side to offer concessions on the central issue of the status of Ukraine. Right? Both sides want to get as many concessions from the other as possible and are threatening war as part of the bargaining process. But both sides realize that it would be better to get those concessions through diplomacy and ne negotiation rather than through war. But one of the problems that both sides face is a lack of trust that the other side will abide by any agreement that might be reached in the future. This is the commitment problem. A commitment problem is the in inability of one side in a conflict to promise or commit to abide by the terms of any settlement, settlement indefinitely in the future. So what Putin is thinking about now is, okay, if I cut a deal with Ukraine, that Ukraine's gonna be independent and not join NATO in 2022, is he gonna live by that agreement in 2032? How can I be sure that any promise that he makes now will be sustained indefinitely and he's not lying to me, right? So organizations like states, they will fight wars if they think that their adversary will demand in the future revisions to terms to any pre-conflict settlement. So if Putin says right now, well, Zelensky is saying in 2022 that he's gonna, gonna stay independent and not join NATO, but I don't trust him. He might join it in 2032, so this is just faking me out. So it's better for me to fight a war now to prevent Zelensky or Ukraine from joining NATO 10 years from now. Because that's a permanent solution, yeah. right? You invade Ukraine, Ukraine's no longer independent, it's part of Russia, yeah. it's not gonna ever enter NATO. Yeah. And so what Putin is saying is that he's prepared to fight a war rather than face a future in which he's gotta make concessions, a future in which Ukraine joins NATO. So this willingness to fight now rather than be the subject to future demands from an adversary grows out of a concern that a rising power will have the power to demand revisions to the status quo. And this condition often arises due to shifts in the distribution of power, such as the resurgence of Russian military power in the 21st century after several decades of weakness following the collapse of the Soviet Union. So these shifts in the distribution of power create expectation that agreements are not self-enforcing and that more powerful states will demand more concessions in the future. And so Russia makes agreements to allow Ukrainian independence when it's weak in 1991 and 1994, and now it's saying, yeah. we want Ukraine back, right? Exactly. And they already Talk did- Talk about a commitment problem. Yeah, and they already did that in 2014 when Russia took back the Crimea, which they had recognized as part of Ukraine in 1991. Right, and in, in 1991, not only did they recognize Ukraine as an independent state and that Ukraine could remain independent, but there was another agreement made, right? Ukraine, when the Soviet Union collapsed, was sitting on the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Yeah. And the United States, along with Russia, didn't want to have another nuclear power. And so they convinced Ukraine to give up all those nuclear weapons, right, with the promise that Russia would not infringe on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And so they promised then that something that is not being followed now. Yep. That is the commitment problem. And that's where, if Ukraine could roll it back and say, they could ask themselves, like, how do we know that 30 years from now, yep. Russia won't, you know, go back on this agreement. And the United States also said, no, you'll be fine. It'll yeah. be, you'll be secure. Yeah. We promise. And, we're, and, Russia, and the United States won't, you know, at least use military force to stop that. This conflict plays out very differently right now if Ukraine has nuclear yeah. weapons. Oh, very differently. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't play out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. And so, so to kind of end this last part of our discussion of this crisis that's still unfolding, the, the commitment problem it has been driven in part by the resurgence of Russia since the end of the Cold War. It's produced an interest on the part of Russia who didn't really like the deal last time but agreed to it, right, um, of the expansion of NATO to say, you know what, we're going to revisit this. And so that has changed the incentives for Russia. And both sides really have a commitment problem. So say they do find this middle ground, the Minsk agreement, whatever it is, or, or some sort of vague promise that is somewhere in between of Ukraine never gets into NATO and we sign a document that promises that, or 
Ukraine is independent and can enter NATO whenever it wants. It's some sort of middle ground that has been floated around um, already. Um, the U.S., the United States and NATO can't trust that Russia will abide permanently by any agreement to guarantee Ukraine's sovereignty in the future, right? They can do this again. They could play it back next year or six months from now or five years from now because of the military imbalance between Russia and Ukraine. Russia cannot trust that the United States and the West and Ukraine itself won't, if it says, no, we're going to stop our aspiration to join NATO. You know, it's not in the cards. It's going to be too hard. There are NATO members against it. Why are we going to fight a war over something that's really not on the table at all? Is kind of what's... And so, don't worry about it. Well, what Russia and Putin said explicitly just today was that even a distant chance of Ukraine joining NATO sometime 20 years from now is an existential threat to uh, Russia. And so they're worried about the commitment problem. What did U Ukraine's President Zelensky say about joining NATO? Well, he, It's not he, just an ambition. Say what, say what he said today. NATO is our life. This, I still... It's, it's an existential yeah. threat not to be in NATO for Ukraine. So this, this statement today was a huge deal. And it exposes the commitment problem because what he publicly said is... To the BBC. To the BBC. You're right. He effectively said, we cannot commit not to joining NATO at some point. And Putin is saying the only way we're going to keep peace here is if Ukraine is never in NATO. Um, and so if you to, look back at that slide where there was this middle ground, and we because I think you're going to fight a war, create millions of refugees, kill thousands of people for something that's actually not on the table right now. Yeah. Ukraine is not going to be able to join NATO anytime soon. Yeah. But because of the commitment problem that Ukraine can't commit to never wanting to join NATO, and Russia can't commit to ever allowing Ukraine to join NATO without threatening invasion. This is where we're at. Yeah. If you want to preserve peace, this was not a, it's fine to say those things in private to your allies. It's another thing to say them publicly. Um, it was really hard to figure out why that comment was made because he's made other comments in, in the last few days. He, he gave another interview, Zelensky, this is the Ukrainian president, saying that, you know, the aspirations of Ukraine to join NATO are, are are distant and, and, and difficult and narrow, and, and of course, Russia is against it, but so are certain members of, of NATO, and you know, it's really not in the cards. Now, that kind of statement is the kind of statement that you can build a, you know, okay, so maybe we can find something, right? Or the Minsk agreement, where you give autonomy to Eastern Ukraine, which could then prevent Ukraine from, at least for a while, not joining NATO, that kind of thing could be the basis for this kind of compromise. But the stances that are taken right now don't suggest that. So That's where we're at. I think Rob has committed to not talking about Ukraine. I have committed. In uh, the next, the next problem. news section, but uh, yeah, that's a commitment problem on his part. So <laughs> we, I, we won't make any promises. We won't even try. I'm committed. Um, but we'll see. I mean, this is going to... Yeah. It's going to stay in the news and in the interim, if a war breaks out, I think we'll start to see the effects in the United States. And we'll right. also talk about that as and, well. And, you know, there is a shorter, there is a window uh, based on weather and other factors that if Russia is going to invade, it's going to have to do it sometime before, you know, at least middle March. And so this isn't going to go on forever, forever at least the, the imminent threat of, of uh, invasion. So they're going to have to pull the trigger or not um, pretty, pretty soon, too. And, the, and one thing, one final thing, the other thing that's significant in the last 24 hours is you've had exchanges of fire between separatist forces and local Ukrainians on the ground. This is, this is a challenge for the, the centralized leaders to control escalation here. Right. And so the, Putin is, 
in a situation now where he's got over 100,000 troops on the border and he's got local separatist forces that can control the agenda. So they could launch an attack, they could trigger a war, say we're being attacked by Ukraine, and that's going to put tremendous amount of pressure on Putin to, to defend. do what he said, which yeah. is and protect Russian speakers. Yeah. And to defend them. And so he could get, he's in, with that level of mobilization, and there is this delegation of the initiative to local separatist forces on the ground, Putin could get, even if he's trying to de-escalate here in the next week, he could get dragged into something, um, into a, a broader conflict, because if, if, the, if Russian speakers in Ukraine start getting killed in skirmishes, then it's going to put public domestic pressure on him to fight. Right. So, all right. And so, yeah. that's it. Have a good weekend, um, and we'll probably be talking about this again. Yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> all right. Bye all right. now. Bye.